Good morning, Saints. All right, I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, I'll start with some interesting fun facts about our speaker today. Um, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, the first thing that I wanted to mention is that our speaker is an unusual computer geek. You know, usually when you uh, uh, connect with computer geeks, they, they're a little difficult to relate with, right? So our, uh, our elder here is a computer geek, but he's relatable. So that, that in itself is uh, actually an interesting uh, fun fact. Um, and the other thing that I, I recently got to know is that uh, most of you know about a lot of the farming that we are doing around the valley. The Lord is blessing our family to move into seven acres. So, and you know, you, some of you have seen our tag team that we're doing with Glenn. We just... Uh, Notice that our head elder is actually a fellow gardener and farmer too, right? I know he's already doing some tomatoes and peppers right now. Uh, he has done quite a bit of a cucumber, so looks like we may be starting a uh, farming club out here with our head elder, all right? Um, and the other thing that you know, if you're, if you're at a church, right, and you have leaders, right, and you know those leaders, if you find those leaders that they have an ability to relate with the very, very little ones, you know you're blessed, right? And so a lot of this, you, you, you notice here, Loni was able to even give the, the children's story. That's a blessing that we have. And my pastor, uh, our elder here has been such an uh, amazing blessing as well. As an example, my boys just enjoy interacting with him and his wife. And so that's, that's, that's just a blessing to, to know you have leaders who are dealing with the really uh, tough issues, but they can come down and really relate with little ones. Uh, and this one is very personal to me, right? And I know Lloydell, Charles, Rodney will relate this. When you are a young man and you've been blessed with a beautiful woman and you're thinking about, okay, how do I make sure I learn the lesson that I need so that her 2022 is better than a 2021, right? Where can I get lessons? You can read books and so forth and so on. But it, it is a, such an amazing thing to be around men who you see having a really awesome relationship with, with their wives. And you know you can learn that. Especially, where, you know, take, talking about the head elder here, uh, a lot of you are uh, great uh, examples as well, but, but the head elder, when you see the playfulness they have uh, in their relationship with his wife, you're wondering, okay, they just got did they just get recently married? Are they still fiancés or they're a teenage uh, love couple? You don't know, but it, it's, uh, it's admirable as a young man to have that available to you to see, and we see that uh, in many of you as well. So we wanted to praise the Lord. Now, in, uh, from the spiritual standpoint, I wanted to mention that, hey, uh, the, Lord, the Lord has power. The Lord has plans. He's, uh, he, he knows uh, about his work. And the Lord, when he in, in, intends to do anything, the Lord will accomplish it, right? The book of Exodus uh, is, is an example of how no mighty general, no mighty army, no mighty king can stop God's work. When he says, my people are going to go, you can't come in between. The book of Esther, as Pastor Dennis Smith has helped us see, basically indicates that no matter how much you conspire against God's work, it's going to go through, right? And those who conspire against God's work, they will actually fall like Haman, right? And the book of Revelation as well, you know, and I'll talk to this when I uh, do my uh, um, sermon on April 9th, about when God says, I'm going to save my people, right? And he gives a blessed assurance that I am coming to get my people. No kingdom, no planning, no strategizing is going to uh, hinder God's work to save his people. That's the assurance he gives us. But these two major challenges, there's multiple challenges, but these two major challenges that the Lord has. Number one is that a lot, when he says in the Bible, who shall I send? Right? He has a struggle finding people who are willing to leave a lot, uh, their love of comfort. This is a significant challenge, particularly in a nation like this, where there's so much comfort around, right? And so when you have the blessedness of our head elder being willing to come and leave the comfortable life of getting a job, having a home, and just doing the normal things and say, I'm going to accept the call and lead God's church. And, you know, leave, and anybody who's been on a church board, especially most of you have so many, so many experience, not church boards, but conference boards and all the other rest, you know it can be a tough, uh, tough uh, battle out there. But the, the, the willingness to live comfort is one challenge. The other one is just the, the, the challenge that God has as well with this. Um, we see that in the Bible where sometimes you see people who are called to leadership and then they end up being weak and uh, fearful leaders, right? So Joshua was even instructed, do not fear. So we, we want, you know, I want to praise the Lord here. I'm going to read a quotation from Ellen White that I think all signs that I see, 
All right, all signs that I see uh, indicate that the Lord has blessed us with a head elder that represents what's being described in this passage. Uh, some of you are familiar with this. This is a, uh, the spirit of prophecy is talking about what is the greatest want of the world. The greatest want of the world is not technology. We don't need more food. We don't need more armies and weapons. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will, who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their innermost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is the true to duty as the needle is to the pole. A man who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. All signs that we see indicate to me just the blessedness of the leadership that we've gotten through, uh, through the Lord of such a time as this, that the Lord has called multiple people to lead this church, and the head elder left his comfort, was willing to come and lead the church. Um, he could have enjoyed the computers, right? And, you know, some of us have done computers. It can be fun doing all the problem solving. But he says, hey, I'm going to accept the call and lead God's people. And now as we transition, uh, looking at the greatness, the greatness of talents that we have in the church, the great talent of resources, and we're looking for a pastor, uh, we, we praise the Lord that we have the elder who's willing to accept the call and willing to stand uh, for right, no, though they have its fall, to lead his church into the next level. So may uh, we welcome our uh, presenter. May, uh, may the Lord bless the message we receive today. Amen. Thank you so much, Rodney. Those words, and just, they just touched my heart. And Cheryl, the music. You know how my mom was a violinist, and I just, my heart, just every time I hear it, is thank you so much. from Fred, both your music, I appreciate it so much. I have a burden on my heart, and this... This, um, this sermon that I'm about to do, I did 10 years ago. And if you remember, we were going through a major election 10 years ago. And everybody thought that if uh, the person got in for a second term, that the world was going to end, right? But I, what I wanted to do at the time, and what I want to do now, is I want us to focus on what God looks at when we choose a leader. Um, we have an election coming up in November, and we also have a little bit of an election here in our church. And I want, to, I want us to learn about how to use spiritual discernment from the Bible. I want to paint a picture. This picture, I grew up outside of Detroit, about 20 miles outside of De Detroit, and um, we used to go to church in downtown Detroit. Um, we used to go to the Central Methodist Church uh, in downtown Detroit. It was situated on Woodward Avenue and right next to Grand Circus Park. To give you another little graphical, uh, geographical area where it's at, the new, I say new, it's 20 years old now probably, the new Tiger Stadium sits right behind it. So you kind of have an idea what it is. It's a cathedral type of church. The church had an awesome, awesome service. Now, my father was a humanist slash atheist. And how would you get that type of person into church? Well, if he had a love for music... That was the way we got him in there. And he, we would drive that 20 miles into downtown Detroit every Sunday, and we would go to this church. Now, the church, what, what, what they used to do is the procession would come out, and they, would, um, they had what was called the crucifer. He would carry the cross, and I did this for a few years, but what I want to tell you is what I used to see when I was very young in this church. But the crucifer would come out, carry the cross. He would lead out the choir of probably close to 30 to 40 different members. It was a big choir. They would lead him out, and it would be two by two behind him. And, of course, the reverends were, would bring up the rear. So they would come through. The crucifer would turn around. He would have his, his 
his, his cross, this pole with the cross, they would come on through and they would seat in, in the back, in the, uh, in, the, um, bit in the sanctuary. And then the reverends would take their seats. Now we had an organ that was in this church and we used to pride ourselves that it was the fifth largest organ in the United States. The lowest note um, of, of this organ was 66 feet tall. So that gives you an idea how big this church was. And when that organist would be cranking out some crazy Bach, and right towards the end, we'd wait for it, he would hit that note. And it would be almost like a 2.5 Richter scale, and you would feel the power of God, is what we thought, and what I thought as a little kid. And the, the, the choir, my dad was a tenor in the choir, and he was faithfully there every Sunday with that, plus uh, choir practices and everything like that. It sounded like angels. I mean, they were perfect pitch. Everything was just manicure perfect. Then, after that was done, the reverend, we called him a reverend, would get up on this huge pulpit that was up to me it seemed like it was 10 feet 20 feet in the air but it wasn't that high it was probably seven feet up into the air beautifully handcrafted wood all the way around it and it was just a sight to be seen he wore a long robe and he would have his banners that would come down through that and he would have like purple on the the trim of the of his robe and he would get up there and he would speak and I, as a young kid, I would kind of like, well, I can't wait until he ends so I can hear that organ and that music again and hear that, that note right at the end when they were playing whatever it was they were playing. So he would go through his, his speak. They would, they would leave it, lead out. The reverends would leave out. And um, the, oh, I'm sorry, the crucifer would lead out with the reverends and then the audience back. And then sure enough, that last note, the 2.5 on the Richter scale note was just awesome, you know? And that was our service. And so I want to draw a comparison. We have this beautiful hand-carved pulpit. And then we have... I'm going to call it the Model G7 right here. Sturdy. It may be handcrafted, but it's simple. And it's, it's simple. And I don't wear a long robe with any kind of banners or anything on it. I wear my J.C. Penney's two-for-one, whatever it was, suit. I don't want to draw the contrast. I never remembered a word or any sermon that, they, that, that was, went on in that church. And the reason that we, that everybody would come to church was for the show. It was for the music. I mean, that's, if it would bring in an atheist, that's what, that's what it, would, it would do. But I always felt empty afterwards. I didn't, there was something missing. Yes, we would have the Word of God. And I think it was called the Good News Bible in a paperback edition that was in the pews. And the only thing that I remember from that Bible is in Michigan in the summer, when it would get kind of warm, it, it would um, get humid. They didn't have a very good air conditioning system in that, in that system. So I would take the Bible and flip it like this to get the air to come up on me. And that's the only remember, remembrance that I have of using a Bible. I want to... I want to bring the word of God to you. And we're going to study from 1 Samuel. And this is when Israel demanded a king. Now, you have Bibles in the front, in, in each of the pew. I either write down the passages or turn in the Bibles and follow along with me. I will have them on the screen, the scripture. And um, I want you to make note of several contrasts of, of the different pictures. And so we can learn what Israel went through because they are examples that we are supposed to learn from. 
Please turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for, look the, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. If you don't mind, I'm going to pray for real quick. Heavenly Father, I pray, please be among us. Please remove the distractions. Please open our hearts and our minds and help us to dwell on your scripture. Help us to draw spiritual discernment. And I pray for your Holy Spirit to be among us. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. We have a very important election coming up in November. And I would like to talk to you today about being careful in choosing who our leaders should be. We can see the results of some of the leaders that have been chosen that have been pretty bad. And I believe we, the people, our king, our president, will be held accountable because as a whole, we will ultimately choose them. Will these leaders follow divine inspiration or will they be led by another spirit? As a nation, what criteria will we use to choose this king or president? What qualities do you look for in making your decision? I do not want to get into any politics whatsoever, but I think it's very important to learn what God says about what we should be looking for in a leader. It is not God's desire for us to be ruled over by sin, sinful-minded man, but only one King Jesus, and that is the King of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. I will be reading a lot from the book of 1 Samuel, and I entitled this sermon, Now Make Us a King, because this is where Israel first demanded a king. In ancient Hebrew manuscripts, 1 and 2 Samuel were one book. They are called after the name Samuel, the prophet, not only because he is the chief character of the first part, uh, 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 8, but also because he anointed both of the other two chief characters of the book, Saul and David. Samuel was, Samuel was the, the last judge of Israel, as well as the first prophet of the king of Israel, chapters 3, 19 through 21. He also ministered before the Lord as a priest in chapter 2, 18. The Jewish people have been living close to four centuries without a central leadership, and they missed it. They, they, so they asked the prophet Samuel to anoint a king. Samuel was not happy over this uh, request because, because God tells him to go ahead. Still, it is clear that God is not happy with it either. 1 Samuel 8, 7. Sorry about that. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. That just breaks my heart. They were rejecting God and who they chose as a leader. This is why I believe that as a whole, we can be held accountable to God for who we choose as our leaders. Are we rejecting God with our decision in who we vote for? Look at the criteria for wanting an earthly king to reign over them in verse 5. And they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Now make us a king to judge us like the nations. Israel's kings were not supposed to be a king like all the nations. In fact, they were not supposed to be a nation like all the nations. They were supposed to be a model of what the ideal nation is all about. A model for the rest of the world to emulate. 
as this should be with any candidate that is running for office, they, are they God-fearing or do they want to rule like all the nations? What is it that we look for in a king? At this point, I should be careful in what we ask for because Israel rejected God. God gave them exactly what they were asking for. 1 Samuel 9, 2. And he, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice man, a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than all, all the people. Okay, he comes from good stock, great family lineage, maybe not the Kennedys, but Saul was notable. Not only for his family, but also for his appearance. Saul was tall, taller than all his people, and good-looking. In fact, there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. Saul looked like a great king, tall, dark, and handsome. I'd vote for him, wouldn't you? I would like to ask a couple questions before I cast my ballot. Does he fear God? Does he obey God? Is he filled with the Spirit of God to lead and direct his people to God? As we see later on, after Saul was anointed king, he did not obey God. As I said before, Israel was supposed to be an example or a witness to the world that people would inquire about the one true God that was leading Israel and causing them to prosper. But their continual rejection of God and his leading Israel found themselves surrounded by the most debased and vile of nations, the Amalekites. And God did not wish his people to possess anything which belonged to the Amalekites. For the, his curse rested upon them and their possessions. Now I want you to notice the parallels between what is happening here and what is happening in our church. Are we a peculiar people? Titus 2.14 Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works? 1 Peter 2.9 But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should not show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are not to emulate what God has called us out of. We are not to touch the unclean. God gave the command through his prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3. 1 Samuel um, also, uh, also said unto Paul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee, be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Alamech and utter, utterly destroy all that, he ha that they have and spare them not but slay both man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. First up, who are the Amalekites? What made them so bad? This looks like God is commanding genocide and that genocide is a very bad thing. So that creates some problems for our understanding of God's goodness. The Amalekites were the descendants and followers of Amalek, grandson of Esau, and that's in Genesis 36, uh, 12 through 16. Brother of Jacob, also known as Israel, 
As such, the Amalekites were total foreigners to God. It, uh, Esau was one who had sold his birthright and his part in God's promise. He had been part of God's covenant people, but he valued his own appetite more. So the Edomites, Esau's descendants, including the Amalekites, were people who had opted to en masse of the covenant which defined God's people. Both the Amalekites really, really didn't like Israel. At the very birth of the nation of Israel, when they came out of Egypt and were at their most vulnerable before they even got to Sinai, and they, were, they didn't even have water, the Amalekites came and attacked them. And that's in Exodus 17, 8. Israel was forced to fight their very first battle, fighting for their lives against the Amalekites under the leadership of Moses. The Amalekites were people who hated Israel right from the start. And though Moses said that God would be at war, it looks as very much as if the Amalekites who were at war with him. Israel had a lot of wars between Moses and Saul, but they never once attacked the Amalekites. The Amalekites attacked Israel, though. In Numbers 14:47, they attacked Israel while they were still in the desert. Judges 3:13 joined with the Moabites in attacking Israel, and in Judges 6:3, they invaded Israel whenever the Israels planted their crops. And together with the Midianites, did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkey. Later in Judges 6 and 7, they invaded again and are fought off by Gideon. The Amalekites show that generation after generation, they are at war with Israel and remember at war with God. The Amalekites weren't just any old people. They were the nation who more than any other tried to destroy Israel. They had been trying to eradicate and plunder Israel from the very birth of Israel, 200 to 400 years, the command in uh, 1 Samuel 15 that they would continue for another 600 years. The Amalekites were vicious as well and were noted for killing their children. So it's clear that God was now not out of the blue committing genocide. This was very evil race of people that were bent on Israel's destruction and that, that is why the command was given to utterly destroy all that they have. Sounds pretty clear? But this is when things start going downhill for Saul and his administration. Let's read 1 Samuel 15 verses 9 through 11. But Saul and the people spared Agog, the best of the sheep and the oxen, and of the fatlings and of the lambs, and all, all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything was vile and refuse, refuse that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be a king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. There has been a few times that I, I have said, it repented me that I had voted for a certain politician. By the way, speaking of politicians, do you remember Jim Gilley from 3ABN? He, uh, he did a, they did a, 3ABM along with Good News TV did a, um, a, a series here in this church. And I had a chance to actually talk to Jim and it was really good to get to know him. And he said that he doesn't vote. He says he will never vote in an election. And it had been like 30, 40 years since he had ever voted. And he said, he's, he told me, he says that, um, he would always keep an eye on them. It's like knowing where your enemy is. He said that if you think about it, Lucifer was the first politician. Look at the havoc he caused in God's government. That's something to think about it. When God says, it repenteth me, it is not repenting as a usual sense as man repenteth in of his sins. But rather the word used here is nacham, 
which is to lament and to grieve. But can you imagine when God said to Samuel, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. I would not want to be on the receiving end of anything that God had grieved or repented of. God did not make a mistake here. God does not force his will or his plans on us, but rather will give, give us what we want, even though he has pleaded with us in our stubborn, stubbornness. How could this be? I mean, he looked so presidential. The campaign went so well. He won by almost a landslide. He also won the popular vote. So many people can't be wrong, can they? With so much deception in politics, how can we be sure we choose the right candidate? Let me ask you something. As Christians, and with anything else that we base our decision on, what should be our standard? Please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 8, verses 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What law? What testimony? It should be in your hand right now. Now, I'm not saying that God will judge us individually based on who we vote for. But as a nation, as a whole, if we keep choosing leaders and passing laws that are going contrary to God's government, then we will slowly start to see God removing his blessings to this great country of ours. Could this happen in our church as well? On a side note, while you're still there, look at verses 19 of Isaiah 8. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and mutter, should not a people seek their God for the living to the dead? Saul had a real problem with obedience to God. Here is an example of qualities that we should not choose in a leader. Now, I have to be careful here because this can lead into a complete other study. 1 Samuel 28, there is an example here of how Saul consulted with the uh, witch of Endor to bring up Samuel so he can get advice on what to do. If God would not answer Saul via Samuel while Samuel was alive, then rest assured, God did not after Samuel had died. Because Saul shut God's pleading through the Holy Spirit out of his life, this is where Saul finally ended up, to seek unto them that have familiar spirits. And it was the end of him. Basically, Saul was now consulting the devil. 1 Samuel 15, 19, 22, and 23. Therefore then this did I, thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord. So Saul is asking, where? Where did I do? Where did I do go wrong? And Samuel has said, the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Obey, to behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken unto the fat of the rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Did you get that? God equates rebellion or disobedience to the sin of witchcraft. One of my favorite authors, Ellen White, had this to say about these verses. God did not want spoil of corrupt people. God required of his people obedience rather than sacrifice. All the riches were his. The cattle upon a thousand hills belonged to him. He did not require the spoil of a corrupt people upon whom his curse rested, even to their utter extinction, to be presented to him to prefigure 
the holy savior as a lamb without a blemish. The first king of Israel per- proved a failure because he set his will above the will of God. Through the prophet Samuel, the Lord instructs Saul that as king of Israel, his course of action must be one of the strictest integrity. Then God would bless his government with prosperity, but Saul refused to make obedience to God his first consideration. And the principles of heaven, the the government of his conduct, he died in dishonor and despair. We cannot place blind confidence in any man, however high his profession of faith or his position. We must not follow his guidance unless the word of God sustains him. So God rejected Saul as king, and the Bible goes on to say that because Saul refused to obey God, he withdrew his spirits. His spirit. Now, friends, this is the scariest place in the world to be. Now, at this time, God was raising up David, an individual that had the right, the right attitude and the right spirit. And this is the part that I like about this whole part of Samuel. And his first thoughts were, is this in harmony with God's law or his word? David was not perfect, matter of fact, far from it. But God could work with him. 1 Samuel 16, 13 through 14. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ram. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. This sounds a little strange, but we must understand that in ancient Hebrew, like most of all other language, languages, then and now, was literally loaded with figurative languages. The writer was using an idiom or a figure of speech to indicate that the Lord allowed or permitted the distressing spirit to come upon Saul. In view of these linguistic data, the evil spirit that came upon Saul may have been his own bad attitude, his ugly disposition of mind that he manifested over and over again. The simplest way to put this, when you take the light, uh, I'll take away light, darkness takes over. And this is exactly what happened with Saul. Now a new election is coming up. And going by all that we have learned, we won't make the same mistake and go by our own criteria. We shall use the Lord's. Look not unto his countenance, nor on the height of his stature. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Our next candidate is considered a man after God's own heart. Why? David was constantly seeking God in everything that he did. He knew Israel, God's people, and when someone threatened or dishonored something that God had sanctified, it did not matter how big The obstacle was, you went in defense of the living God. 1 Samuel 17, 26. And David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I get chills every time I hear this. What, what, what honor that he had for God in his heart. Defy the, limi- the armies of the living God. God was always real to David, as it should be for us. We need to conduct our, our lives as if we are in the presence of God continually. This is not David be, be, being patriotic here. He understood that if you are offending Israel, you are offending God. Should not our leaders defend God and his government first? 
or go ahead and pass laws that are in direct violation with God's law. You all know the story of David and Goliath, the young shepherd boy against the giant Philistine. But here, look at what is one of the best examples of the qualities of a successful and truly blessed leader. Not because he's handsome, delivers some of the greatest speeches, or has won by the popular vote, but because even in the worst of circumstances, God is living and working in his life. 1 Samuel 17, 45-46 Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with sword and with spear and with shield, but I come unto you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and will give the carcass of the hosts of the Philistines unto this, un, this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. As a people... Or a nation, does all the earth know that there is a God in Israel in our lives today? We need to pray for our leaders, that they, they will make the right decision, that they will seek the counsel of the true living God. And we also need to pray for we, the people, that we use the right criteria in making a God-inspired and prayerful decision in what fish, officials we elect. This definitely goes for our church leaders as well. Yes, the election process is different, but it is, it's worse if they disobey and teach men to do so. John 19, 14 through 15. And it was the preparation of the Passover, about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. All through the Bible, Israel demanded a king a man to rule over them, even when the king of kings was in their very presence. They shout, we have no king but Caesar. The God of heaven heard their choice, as he will hear every choice that we make. Again, Mrs. White comments on this terrible scene. Forty years after Jerusalem was destroyed and the Roman power ruled over the people, then they had no deliverer. They had no king but Caesar. Henceforth, the Jewish nation, as a nation, was a branch severed from the vine, a dead, fruitless branch to be gathered up and burned from land to land throughout the world, from century to century, dead in trespasses and sins without a savior. We have such a long-suffering and loving God who loves us so much. I believe this country was founded by God's providence and God has richly blessed us as a nation. And if we, and if and when you go to vote any leader into office, whether it's in a secular world for a position like senator, governor, or president, or if it's here close to home, our church, the position of deacon, elder, treasurer, or pastor. Bring the Lord Jesus into your decision making. In closing, I want to compare just a couple of scriptures here. And I want you to look closely on this. Matthew twenty-one thirteen. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Matthew twenty-three thirty-eight. Behold, your house 
is left unto you desolate. Just two chapters apart, Jesus referred to the temple or the church as his house. And now it's your house and it's desolate. Marion Webster has some fitting definitions of the word desolate. Number one, devo devoid of inhabitants. In other words, without Christ. Number two, joyless, sorrowful, or as through separation from a loved one. Number three, barren and lifeless. What caused this? How did this happen? If we let the Bible tell us, and if we observe our great example, Jesus, what did he do while he was in church? Luke 4, 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue, or the church, on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Now, what did he read? If you go down further, if you keep reading, it's obvious. It's the scriptures, the word of God he is reading every Sabbath. So this would be a diminishing of God's word in the temple or the church. Next, what does he say just before he declares it's desolate? Matthew 23, 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent to thee. How often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Jesus has sent messengers to warn us. So it looks like when the church has become desolate, they are rejecting the spirit of prophecy or God's messengers. And they are not reading the scriptures in church. They're not studying God's word. It is my prayer that as a nation or a church, we never claim to have no king but Caesar. Can you imagine how those words must have hurt Jesus? I would imagine the same as when we demanded, now make us a king. As a church, we have a big decision before us. What will be our criteria for this selection? Are we tired of not having a pastor and will take anything that is recommended to us? Or we don't want to go through any inconvenience that might take a little bit longer, so give us what you got. Or are you ready to see God perform miracles in this church? Are you ready to bring in so many souls that love Jesus that we don't have enough room in here? Are you ready for the latter rain? Are you ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Are you ready for Jesus to say to his house, his house, his church, well done, my good and faithful servants. Enter thou now into the joy of the Lord. Revelation 14.10. Before I read this, I want to I wanna let you know, in your bulletin, you have a little insert that's in there. And I want to make note of it, and I want you to use biblical discernment that we have used today, that we discussed in, in today's message. And I want you to go and look at these selections, the three selections that we have, and I want you to pray, seriously pray, what we would have as a pastor for our next pastor. And please look at all of them and, and look at all that they have on their videos and pray and then speak your mind. Don't, don't hide your light under a barrel. Speak your mind what you truly feel about the selections. Revelation 14.10 And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. 
and worshipped him that lived forever and ever and cast their crowns before him saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thou pleasure they are and were created our closing hymn I chose because he is our king he is our lord of lord we want to crown him with many crowns amen shall we stand to indicate our that we've chosen christ as our king Heavenly Father, we pray so earnestly this morning for spiritual discernment. Please send the Holy Spirit to fill our minds and our hearts. Guide us to those passages in your word. They'll help us to understand how to choose a leader and how to go forward. We pray, Lord, we're at a crossroads where this can either stifle the church and stop the growth and not to go forward or we can be the, on the receiving end of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to bring in the latter rain to go forward to bring as many souls as possible into this church for you Lord Jesus they're your people that are out there we want to be an active church we want to go forward 
and do your will. We ask this in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen.